Well, thousands of satellites being sent up into the sky to monitor your carbon footprint, watching everything you do. Is this part of a larger plan around CBDCs, our digital IDs, tracking everything we do? I know it sounds like science fiction, but it's actually happening. And our next guest has written extensively about it called Debt From Above, a new piece that our next guest, Whitney Webb, has just written, The Carbon Credit Coup. Latin America is quietly being forced into a carbon market scheme through regional contractual obligations enforced by satellites of a U.S. intelligence-linked firm. So launching satellites into the sky to watch everything we do as part of what? Sort of a social credit score, sort of our carbon score. You've traveled too much this week, so you are locked down. You're not allowed to leave your house. Let's find out what this actually means for all of us. I know, again, this sounds like science fiction, but Whitney Webb has been warning about it, warning us about it for a couple of years now, and she joins us now. And great investigative journalist. Whitney, welcome back to the show. Hey, great to be here, Clayton. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So you've been following, of course, the move towards central bank digital currencies, digital IDs, tracking everything. They want us to stop mm -hmm. using cash. We're seeing that, of course. You just go to any a lot of different restaurants now, a lot of different businesses. Sorry, we don't accept cash in the European Union. Uh, if you use over a certain threshold of cash, you're considered part of the gray market. You're considered part of a people who would they would consider terrorists. <laughs> They'd like be watching you, as uh, Christine Lagarde mm -hmm. has said, the European commissioner. So is this satellite launching as part of this tracking in moving towards central bank digital currencies? Yeah, so the end goal of this is to have it integrated with all of these things. So one of the pillars of the economy to come doesn't just include CBDCs and their private sector equivalents. It also includes carbon markets. And one of the main architects of this coming system, people like Mark Carney, the UN uh, envoy for climate finance, who was previously head of the Central Bank of England and, and also Canada, has been one of the point men appointment for this. And there's a lot of different factors that are uh, going to feed into this new financial system. So you touched on a few like digital ID um, and also like the digital wallet and carbon markets are meant to be part of that. And that's why some of the key entities uh, that are being used to create and develop this system, like the World Bank, for example, that's why we've had Carney, uh, BlackRock's Larry Fink, for example, say the key to tackling climate change is reimagining the World Bank specifically in other parts of the multilateral development banking system. They're working alongside groups like uh, Google's philanthropic arm, google.org, on creating climate wallets. And a lot of uh, that program <laughs> specifically is tied into the program that I wrote about with uh, Bitcoin Magazine's editor-in-chief, Mark Goodwin, this debt from above piece. I'm just talking specifically about this program called Green Plus that shares affiliations with that same uh, entity housed within the World Bank called the Climate Action Data Trust that's producing this climate wallet. Uh, Green Plus specifically claims to be focusing for now on monitoring uh, the protected areas of all of Latin America. Uh, but they say in their press release uh, discussing their affiliation with the satellite company uh, that's that has various ties to intelligence that the goal is to monitor your carbon emissions from space as part of this metric known as the global footprint or the ecological footprint, which is promoted by this group called the Global Footprint Network, which has its antecedents in the Club of Rome, uh, which people may know of because it came under scrutiny during um, when the World Economic Forum came under scrutiny from independent media in the COVID era, uh, because the Club of Rome is, uh, was uh, popularized this paper called The Limits of Growth, and produced a book on the subject that was uh, very intimately tied to the earliest meetings of the World Economic Forum. And it's basically this idea um, that uh, we will surpass the limits to growth if we don't change course and deindustrialize. And a lot of this mentality that's in the modern mainstream environmental movement uh, has its antecedents with that particular organization. But the Club of Rome, if you look at the people that created it, um, it's families like the Rockefeller family who have been uh, notorious in the early 20th century and before for funding the eugenics movement, specifically seeing the growth of population in Latin America as a threat to global security, among other things, and also uh, wanting to deindustrialize the planet uh, for the benefit of, of you know, it's uh, the, the oligarchs that are essentially have been running the Club of Rome and, and related groups for some time. Um, 
they're they're essentially very very focused on trying to keep the global south under the thumb of well really it's colonialism but under different names and they framed it as environmentalism at this point but it's an effort to control industrial levels uh, and population levels and these are the different metrics that they've invented for it. But the Club of Rome has been criticized for a very long time for essentially being neo-Malthusian um, and um, definitely not necessary. I would argue that they're not really so, so much interested in saving the planet as they are in uh, micromanaging society. It's really more of a, of a push for a technocratic system of governance, which is something that the World Economic Forum and these other entities um, have been promoting and leading us towards for some time. And a lot of this uh, system that they've, you know, that's been developed by these different groups over the years uh, rests or, or rather requires things like the digital ID and all of these different things to function. And what's interesting about this Green Plus program uh, in particular is that they're trying to place this specifically on the Bitcoin blockchain through a sidechain protocol uh, that, that is, is linked to Bitcoin called Rootstock. Um, and so there's these efforts to have, um, you know, if people like Larry Fink have come out and said uh, everything is going to be on a universal ledger as he's talking about, you know, the launch of Bitcoin ETFs and the, all the tokenization of real world asset efforts. And this goes, you know, this is this is the digital ID agenda. It's essential to this new financial system they're trying to make. And carbon markets are a key part of it, but they've been routinely overlooked, I would argue. I mean, my mind goes directly to seeing these satellites creating an entire web around the earth that they can monitor sort of hot spots where countries, yeah. industries are using too much carbon. They're burning too much carbon. They're burning too much, mm -hmm. quote unquote, fossil fuels. Your ships, your your long haul trucks have exceeded a certain cap. Get ready for some sort of government regulation as a result of it. That's I mean, seems where it starts, maybe at that high level. But then it's going to it's going to affect all of us. I mean, I feel like it's going to come and affect me. It's going to affect you. It's going to be something that they're going to try to use against individual citizens. Yeah, well, they're going to frame it as uh, voluntary and as sort of a, something that's applying to everyone. But really, it's going to be a way to enforce this neo-feudal economic paradigm they're trying to impose on everyone because the wealthy, the elite, will be able to afford carbon offsets for all of these different activities that they want to do to engage in their existing lifestyle. It's such a joke, uh, isn't regular it? Regular like, people it, it, like us will not. It's like plenary indulgences, right, for our, uh, you know, our... our folks who understand their history and religion, right? You could buy, you could buy plenary indulgences if you wanted to sin, right? If you had enough money, I mean, I, I guess that's very sort of like, similar. Because <laughs> what it's like, someone, I, one day someone I think might have corrected me and said they still actually exist. I don't know if plenary, someone who's watching right now can let me know, let me know if you can still buy basically your, your way through allowing yourself to sin within a church, yeah. but uh, it's crazy. Yes, well, they've essentially been reinvented in some sense uh, in, as carbon markets. And what's interesting is that carbon markets, despite their their central uh, the central aspect they're poised to play in this coming financial system, have had a lot have generated a lot of controversy. They've been routinely found to be, you know, essentially over ninety percent worthless. A lot of the ones on existing markets and some of the biggest carbon credit certifiers in the world have been wrapped up. Um, in these scandals, but the answer has not been to um, clamp down or, or change anything that would prevent fraud or grift in the industry. Instead, it's uh, to insure carbon credits. So they've instead created a new market for the insurance industry to try and create what they call a high credibility carbon market to try and restore investor confidence. Uh, but really, they're just, you know, uh, allowing this this grift and this this fraud that's been rampant in the market up until now to continue. They're just adding an insurance layer to it. So now you'll have to pay more to insure your carbon credits or pay slightly more for your carbon offsets and, it, and things of that nature. So and as we move away from cash, as we move away from cash, we move away from hard assets and move away from owning things. Of course, they do not really want you to own homes. They want you to be part of this sort of collective, this digital collective now, and where they're going to be monitoring all of us through this digital wallet structure. It seems like yeah. we've had and this- And you'll be renting everything. Right. You won't be owning homes. <clears throat> the, there's been a number of articles over the past few months from a lot of high profile media publications, and I've been bookmarking them and saving them, but I've seen this trend 
where it's promoting the idea that you shouldn't even own a single family home anymore. That's not something that's good for you. It's not good for the environment. You shouldn't do that. It's not good for it's not good for communities to have single family homes. You shouldn't have a yard. You shouldn't have a driveway. And so there've been a lot of people pushing in this direction lately. Um, and it seems to be a part of this process where you won't own homes. Can you talk a little bit about like the, the like the digital ID structure and how? Do we have like a template on how this is going to look? We've here all of these different yeah. examples. We have Dia, the Dia app in Ukraine, of course, where you can mm -hmm. rat, rat mm -hmm. on your neighbors. You can pay for the subway. You can do all of those things. We hear about China, the social credit score. If you buy too much alcohol, it's your like lose social credit score points and all of that. What if it is true? And can you piece all of these things together to give us a sense of like what's coming to the United States? Yeah, so the digital ID agenda is very similar to what's been rolled out in Ukraine and also in China. It's essentially housed within SDG 16, that being Sustainable Development Goal 16. That's been embraced essentially by all countries, and that's why you have, for example, essentially uh, the vast majority of countries in the world in seeming lockstep over the course of this year and next year implementing biometric entry and exit requirements. Um, the U.S. is in an effort to uh, manufacture, or the U.S. government is manufacturing consent through that. Uh, right now by pushing the so-called smart wall as the solution to the U.S.-Mexico border crisis, for example. Um, but you have you know, even uh, politicians that claim to rail against, for example, the CBDC agenda. People like Ron DeSantis have gone full steam ahead uh, within the state of Florida, pushing for the Florida smart ID card, which is produced by a World Economic Forum strategic partner, Thales, which I believe is based in France. Um, the, the effort here is to basically have what uh, Amazon and some of these other companies have been trying to roll out over the past couple of years, the idea that your identification will just be your face, your biometrics, and it's being framed as convenience. Uh, you have JP Morgan, for example, uh, going full steam ahead also with the idea that instead of using a card at an ATM, you will just scan your face and that will allow you access uh, to get uh, you know, access money either through an ATM, but of course we're moving through to a cashless society. So it, the idea is to have it be like it's been rolled out at Whole Foods, pay with your palm, pay with your face. Um, and this is, um, you know, that's the financial component, but it's also meant to be your ID um, for all sorts of things. And that's why you have these entities like WorldCoin, for example, being rolled out. The idea is to have WorldCoin be, you know, tied to a wallet. So when you sign up and scan your iris, you're given these world coins. You're also given a unique identifier tied to your iris scan. And the idea is to have that not just be your ID when you're out, you know, maybe doing things or trying to obtain certain services, but also your your way of identifying yourself online. So it's also intimately intimately tied to the efforts to end anonymity on the internet, which is a long standing agenda that I've written about for a long time. And they've been trying to implement this in various countries. Normally, under uh, it's pretty frequently done under the guise of protecting children uh, on the internet or. Uh, you know, uh, age verification for social media, that's also something that's been rolled out in Florida. And I would argue that it's uh, essentially a Trojan horse for this type of stuff. The idea of trying to get you to uh, link a government issued ID to your online activity, which is very troubling when we consider that a lot of the infrastructure set up in place by both the Biden administration, the Trump administration and preceding administrations of this, you know, the war on domestic terror is framed at linking your activity on social media and online in general to a government issued ID for the purpose of being able to prosecute you for crimes, speech crimes and things like that committed online or use what you've said online previously and run it through predictive analytics using artificial intelligence to determine if you may commit a crime in the future. And this was actually promoted by the Trump administration uh, or figures within it. Uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka were big proponents of it. It was uh, creating this uh, health DARPA department that Biden actually made. He called it ARPA-H, though. But the flagship program of that uh, was called Safe Homes and, and was about running so American social media posts in mass uh, through an artificial intelligence algorithm to identify early neuropsychiatric warning signs as an effort to prevent mass shootings before they occur. So, you know, based on your social media post, AI will determine if your guns should be taken away, something like that. And that was being fielded during the Trump administration. So this is something that is uh, obviously a bipartisan uh, 
you know, agenda, unfortunately, and it's housed within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, um, a lot of these different agendas can be found there. And I think we're seeing an unprecedented effort to have this marketed to people, specifically in the, the United States, under different metrics. So for a long time, a lot of these um, agendas have been framed sort of using left-leaning rhetoric and coming from the public sector. We're also seeing an effort now to shift that in an effort to manufacture consent to have it be a private sector thing. And this is something that's happened before um, in, in, the U, in U.S. history, where, for example, after 9-11, there was an effort to create the surveillance program called Total Information Awareness uh, in the, uh, in, uh, as an office in DARPA, which is uh, the Pentagon. And it was uh, rightly criticized for ending uh, uh, U.S. Pri privacy of U.S. citizens. And what they did instead is that they privatized it and they turned it into Palantir, um, which was created by Peter Thiel, for example, one of the co-founders of PayPal, and is now a contractor to every U.S. intelligence agency and serves all of the same functions that TIA, Total Information Awareness, was designed to do, including this predictive analytic stuff. And they also ran all the COVID data and all this other stuff. I mean, they've become a huge uh, surveillance monster, essentially, at the end of the day. And oddly enough, the satellite company, as part of this Green Plus program, has teamed up with Palantir, has put Palantir in space, which was actually one of the final ambitions of the Total Information Awareness Program. So you're having all of this being folded in with these various uh, pillars of this new financial system, which again includes carbon markets, but also includes digital ID, ending online anonymity, uh, and, and digital uh, money that is both programmable and surveillable. And it's important to point out too that CBDCs are that, but there's also efforts to create private sector equivalents that are just as surveillable and programmable as CBDCs could be. It may not be the central bank programming them, and passing your data to the government. But um, JP Morgan doing that is really, you know, at a functional level, as far as it affects human freedom and civil liberties, really no different. And there's efforts to foist that upon the American public as well. Um, the idea of, uh, you know, the stable coin, the stable coin bill, for example, that's come up um, in Congress and trying to create, um, you know, regulations around dollar based stable coins, those stable coins, depending on who issues them, can be just as programmable and surveillable, if not more so than anything that the Fed could potentially put out. And it's important to keep in mind, too, that the Federal Reserve is essentially owned by the private commercial banks in the United States. So having the private commercial banks directly issue programmable, surveillable money to the American public is really fundamentally no different than the Federal Reserve doing so since they're ultimately controlled by the same entity. I mean, the most right. powerful bank in the Federal Reserve system is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and the biggest shareholders and controllers of that are J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, as an example. So having J.P. Morgan and Citigroup give uh, issue stable coins that are programmable and surveillable and have that face the public, I mean, that's how you're getting the CBDC under a different name. Uh, but they're going to try and frame it as private sector innovation. And it's not a, you know, we're against CBDC, just like Ron DeSantis and Trump have publicly said, but are they against these program, are they against programmable, surveillable money, period? Are they against JP Morgan and Citigroup or BlackRock or whoever, any of these Wall Street entities issuing these types of currencies to people and having them use it? I haven't heard anything in that regard. And JP Morgan, for example, uh, completely canceled the bank accounts of top executives at Dr. Mercola's company right. uh, without any explanation given. I mean, the private sector has done this um, and, and have done it without really any meaningful backlash or any meaningful consequences. So to give them, uh, you know, the ability to control and, and, and surveil our money that, you know, there's I think there's going to be a, a distinct effort to do that. And um, it's interesting, too, is that uh, when uh, during the Trump administration, Jared Kushner was actually promoting the idea of creating a USD coin, a stable coin that functioned just like this, uh, talking to Steve Mnuchin, uh, who was Trump's Treasury Secretary. And actually, uh, Steve Mnuchin is the person who chairs the board of this intelligence link satellite company surveilling carbon emissions in Latin America now. Um, and, it, you know, the U.S. government is, is very involved here. And as far as stable coins go, on the board of this company 
um, satellite company, as well as a man named Howard Lutnick, who is the head of a, a financial services for firm called Cantor Fitzgerald. And Cantor Fitzgerald is the biggest custodian of the treasury bills behind uh, the largest U.S. dollar stable coin known as Tether or USDT. And so um, I think, uh, as, as you know, as discussed in this piece, there's a distinct effort also to have people in Latin America flock to these dollar backed stable coins um, that are sort of tied up in these carbon market agenda uh, agendas and tether interestingly enough um, fr- you know even though it's framed as a, as a service to bank the unbanked uh, recently uh, allowed the FBI the Secret Service and US intelligence agencies access to its platform so it can blacklist anyone and it's presumably a private sector, you know, issued stable coin to a degree, um, but it's the biggest, also the biggest purchaser of U.S. Treasury bills or U.S. government debt. And there's a very, uh, you know, having people like Mnuchin, Cantor Fitzgerald tied up in this uh, particular, you know, carbon market surveillance paradigm uh, that's being, that's been imposed in Latin America through these like opaque contractual agreements at the municipal level throughout the continent. Very big things are happening here. And actually the head, the guy that runs Teller, a guy named Paolo Arduino, um, has openly said that the goal of Tether is to expand U.S. dollar hegemony worldwide. So there's definitely a play here to have this carbon market, at least as it relates to, you know, Latin America and how it's being opposed there to have to have it, um, you know, essentially serve U.S. empire in a lot of ways. And I think that's reflected in the fact that this satellite company um was created by uh, career contractors to DARPA, to the NSA, to DHS, to all of these intelligence firms. They're, you know, nominally an Argentinian firm, but, you know, they're, they're steeped in these ties to U.S. intelligence, partnered with Palantir, partnered with Musk SpaceX, uh, chaired by Steve Mnuchin. Uh, Joseph Dunford, head of Joint Chiefs of Staff under Trump, is on the board of directors. Um, you know, there's obviously something very, very sinister, I would argue, going on here. And, Another thing that I should mention in the context of carbon markets is that when you certify a carbon credit uh, based on a you know a forest somewhere, let's say a, a chunk of Colombian rainforest, uh, there becomes this issues of carbon rights. Who actually owns the rights to the carbon in the tree? The person that has bought the carbon credit, do they become the owners of the carbon represented uh, in this particular forest? And there's actually no existing legal framework to say that, you know, that's not the case. It definitely is being uh, posited by certain groups involved in this, that there is a, a way to obtain land by purchasing the carbon carbon credits hmm. or, or rather, if not directly obtaining the land, being able to exercise control over how that that land is used and managed or if it can even be exploited or things like this. Um, so there's a lot of interesting issues here uh, that are really troubling as it relates to Latin American, both financial sovereignty and environmental sovereignty, really. And also by creating these contractual agreements at the at the municipal level, you're uh, going around national governments and going straight to local governments, which at least in Latin America um, are quite easy to bribe. This can be, you know, not that national <laughs> governments aren't susceptible to that, yeah. but at the municipal level, uh, th- there's a lot more uh, entrenched corruption in that sense. It's a mu- it's a lot easier to influence them in that regard, and it doesn't get national media coverage because it's happening on the local level. And another thing I should point out, too, is that some of the actors here are career financial criminals. Um, For example, one of the main funders of one of the entities behind this, who's actually a big figure in UN-backed green finance initiatives, is a man named Craig Kogut, uh, who was directly and intimately involved in the junk bond scandal of Drexel Burnham Lambert in the 1980s. And oddly enough, the person who invented carbon credit trading was a senior vice president at Drexel Burnham Lambert when that same scandal was ongoing named Richard Sander. And he's also the father of derivatives and the creator of the collateral mortgage obligation or CMOs, which is essentially what caused the 2008 financial crisis. So you have people that have, you know, been career toxic debt lords creating this new system of quote unquote green finance and imposing it on Latin America, uh, which is, you know, uh, a continent that has been enslaved by debt through the IMF, the World Bank, and these same financial predators from Wall Street are reinventing these institutions, finding new ways, not just to um, in, you know, continue that debt slavery model, but also, you know, make 
land grabs of the natural world and the natural resources under the guise of conserving it and adding this sense of urgency that if we don't implement these types of plans, everyone will die. The environment will collapse. The planet is doomed. Right. They need to keep this it's narrative going that the earth, is, the earth is collapsing. It's, uh, it's on fire. <laughs> we better stop this immediately. It's the great, it's an existential threat as you hear from president Biden and AOC. Um, we even saw, um, I don't know, she's the girlfriend or fiance of Jeff Bezos a few weeks ago at an Amazon event, uh, showing off these new, uh, these new satellite this new satellite initiative, what's going to go up and they're going to be a part of this mapping of the earth to monitor the carbon on the planet. And she's super excited about it. She wants to really make sure that you don't eat meat. And she's going to be tracking all of this. This is a big initiative that they're very excited about over at Amazon and Jeff Bezos. What is his his role in all of this? Um, well, Jeff Bezos, specifically, I haven't looked at uh, too much. Um, I do know he's very involved in the efforts to uh, mine uh, a bunch of nickel and lithium deposits uh, through cobalt metals, where he's partnered with people like Bill Gates. Um, and then on this particular satellite firm that's a, a, a focus of this article, uh, one of the top chim uh, chief information officers uh, of Amazon or Amazon Web Services. Uh. Um, is represented on the board. Uh, but, you know, Jeff Bezos and a lot of these billionaires are, you know, the engines driving this. Silicon Valley bil billionaires are these particular, you know, the, the real people that are um, generating the financial incentives for all these different companies to pop up and, and, you know, come together to create these markets because, you know, the UN is promoting them, but they're essentially public private partnerships. And so the Silicon Valley entities, uh, and these billionaires, you know, they, fi they finance NGOs and all these other groups that help, you know, connect all of this together. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these Silicon Valley billionaires are interested in things like transhumanism, technocracy, and all these different systems. Uh, and they, f they mask a lot of what they do under the guise of altruism. For example, one of the philosophical underpinnings of a lot of um, these Silicon Valley billionaires, they frame as effective altruism, which is a, the name, Sam Bakeman Freed, for example, was an effective altruist and can't claim to be, you know, doing all these things out of altruistic motives, but it's not really altruism at the end of the day. It's about um, securing, you know, their control and, and their role into the future in these new economic paradigms where they'll be even more, pen, uh, you know, powerful than they are now and will be even more dependent on them than we are now. And you know, unfortunately, uh, when she was uh, working and, and advising this particular, was, was uh, helping manage a project at Stanford Law um, that was specifically about using a, a carbon coin and carbon credits to enable U.S. government quantitative easing, which of course, uh, if you're not familiar with quantitative easing, it's the central bank policy of endless money printing. So basically using uh, carbon-based life, tokenizing it so it can become a tradable financial project uh, and, and using that to enable uh, insane fiscal irresponsibility, which is what quantitative easing essentially has been since it's been, you know, widely used by, by the Federal Reserve. Um, I mean, that's just totally insane. So there's all these efforts because debt in the U.S., the U.S. government debt is so bad, right? Where are we going to stuff all of this debt? Um, who's going to buy up all the treasuries and service all this debt? There's an effort to do it with carbon markets. There's an effort to do it with stable coins. And in this particular um program that Mark Goodwin and I talk about in this article, uh, they're coming together and they're coming together in a way where it's being contractually imposed on the global South without people here in Latin America, because I live here, without people here having any idea this is going on. Hmm. No consent. You know, I, I want to do a whole separate interview on this border wall and how you mentioned it briefly but uh, I just want to get your sense of what that actually looks like. So we've been talking about, you know, building the wall, Trump's, you know, building the wall that hasn't happened. The, the U.S. southern border is just, of course, wide open. Upwards of 10, maybe more millions of illegal uh, immigrants have poured across the U.S. southern border. And now talk of this digital wall. What will that look like and how would it actually help America or will it? Um, so the idea is, it's not just the physical border. The idea is to have this biometric entry and exit program implemented through every port of entry in the United States. So that's terrestrial, uh, that's airports, that's, you know, at, uh, in, in ports 
also anywhere you would enter the U.S. or exit the U.S. I is see. to have it be a biometric system. Hmm. And so TSA, for example, has been rolling this out. There's been efforts uh, to get people to voluntarily, at least at least at first, uh, onboard and oh, you can get through security faster if you scan your face and upload your biometrics and make this this profile with this particular company or do it through TSA. Um, and that same type of system is what they want to have at the, uh, on the physical border as well. And you know they've said, for example, because this is also being rolled out in the European Union and in the in the United Kingdom, you know they've said that they've tried to sell it as saying this will reduce wait times because your ID is your face. Right. Um, but actually, they've shown that it's going to at least at least in the case of the UK between EU and UK travel increase the wait time ten times over. So that's wow. not necessarily true. Yeah, it's and so it's not it's not about convenience. It's about surveillance. It's about this, you know, facial recognition, having everything you do uh, be tied to your biometrics. And that doesn't just include what you're doing in the physical world. That's meant to also include what you're doing in the online world and have it be all uh uh, all that data being compiled and analyzed by AI to determine if you're a threat to order and things like that. So you're not, web not surfing. necessarily that's going to be rolled out right away. Um, those but that's components the dream. of it, but it's on the books and that's the plan. That's the mm -hmm. dream, right? It's and, to, they'll know your web surfing history. They'll know all of that. Your social media posts. Do you hang out? Do you, yes. you know, do you go to infowars.com and listen to Alex Jones? Are you that type of a person? Mm -hmm. Do you read conservative websites? Do you, interact with uh or what kind of apps are you using you're using your face to open up your phone all the time like this is the dream so they'd have all of that information yes. And, and the, the infrastructure put out by the Biden administration on the war on domestic terror frames people who are concerned about government overreach as being potential domestic terrorists. So it doesn't even, you don't even have to be a conservative or anything like that. You can just be concerned about perceived government overreach and you can be put on a list under these type of metrics. And it's very important to point out the same entities tied to the satellite company that we discuss in this piece are, is also the same network that is building the U.S. smart wall. Um, the main, one of the main contractors for building this smart wall is a company called Anduril that's produced by or was created by a guy named Palmer Lucky and this other figure named Trey Stevens. Uh, Palmer Lucky uh, is the creator of Oculus Rift, the virtual reality system that was sold to Facebook with the help of Peter Thiel, who Peter Thiel being uh, the co-founder and creator of Palantir. And um, uh, Palmer Lucky's Anduril has been funded uh, by Founders Fund, which is Peter Thiel, and a partner, uh, Trey Stevens, is a veteran of U.S. intelligence, veteran of Palantir, who then, with Palmer Lucky, created Anduril and is, um, you know, works for Founders Fund and was also on the board of Carbine 911, this Israeli intelligence front that was funded by Jeffrey Epstein uh, and, and chaired for a significant amount of time by Ehud, Ara uh, Ehud Barak, had um the former commander of Unit 8200 on its board. Um, Trey Stevens was one of the few, I think the only like American citizen that was on the board of that when it launched. And he's still on the board uh, now with Michael Chertoff, former head of the DHS alongside him. And Anduril is specifically uh, creating autonomous weapons for the US military. They've been uh, piloted in Ukraine, for example. And the goal of Palmer Lucky is to have completely autonomous warfare without human oversight. He's tried to get away from that and say that's not the case, but he's also on video elsewhere saying that is the case. And this is very troubling because the, the same type of you know, surveillance systems that, um, you know, see, recognize your face and facial rec recognition and all of that are also being used to target and murder people right. in war zones right now. And Palantir uh, and a lot of these Peter Thiel co uh, funded companies are being, have been tested, you know, significantly in places like Ukraine. And also they've teamed up with Israel um, in, uh, for their war on Gaza. And this stuff later could be exported um, and, you know, create a, a paradigm where, you know, no human oversight, um, you're on a list, you're trying to cross a border of some country. I mean, the, bad things could happen. I mean, we are sleepwalking into a nightmare here. And it's very disturbing um, when you consider that. Uh, Anduril and a lot of these other companies are contractors to the U.S. military, contractors to U.S. intelligence, um, you know, really 
intimately tied up with the exact same deep state that Trump supporters revile. And Trump himself no longer supports a physical barrier. As of 2019, he said, we're all in on the smart wall. Mexico, uh, as he promised, right, was gonna he was gonna get them to pay for a physical wall, but Mexico has actually paid to help build the smart wall. Democrats love the smart wall. One of the biggest proponents of the smart wall uh, that helped get Andrew uh, these contracts is this former CIA uh, officer turned congressman William Hurd. Um, and you know the CIA wants this border wall, and it also is the same exact type of uh, biometric entry and exit system that's being rolled out throughout the European Union and all these other places. But it's being framed as a way, you know, to stop the globalist agenda of migration, but I would uh, of illegal immigration. But frankly, uh, the migration situation in the U.S. has been bad well before. Um, independent media started to pay more attention to it over the course of the past year. And I think, you know, if Democrats and Republicans both agree about this uh, and the Biden administration, you know, is on its way out, why would they, um, you know, I think what's what they've been doing on the border is allowing a desperate situation to take place so that the opposing side can come in and uh, offer the solution, which is the solution both parties have wanted for the better part of 20 years. Uh, after 9-11, they tried to do the same smart wall um, on, on the Bush administration. It was called SBI net. And, um, you know, that's essentially what Anderol and General Dynamics and some of these other firms are, are now building. And it's, it's not necessarily great for, I, wouldn't argue, I would argue it's not good for freedom at all. And it could be used to keep people in just as much as it could theoretically keep people out. And even in the places where these smart walls exist, it's not like they're necessarily keeping people out. I think the idea is to have um, you know, to me, get people so worked up and, and angry about Ill illegal immigration, even though it's been something that's been going on for decades, um, but have people so focused on it now so that we can man they, they can manufacture consent for this for this smart wall. That's, you know, all these intelligence contractors and people tied to the deep state. Um, I don't I don't no, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot more going on here, and it's uh, it definitely deserves a lot of scrutiny. Um, and I don't think it's it's the answer that it's being pitched as. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of cover being given right now to these on, on those folks on the right uh, who are in lockstep with this uniparty idea to monitor, surveil, and to continue to build out this infrastructure here. And uh, there's sort of like a willful ignorance when it comes to some of these leaders right now, especially Trump. I think there's there's a lot of willful ignorance going around uh, about Trump and the support of the Ukraine bill and all of these things right now. So um, it's it's really terrifying. It's really terrifying to think that this is coming. Um, well, Whitney, as always, you've uh, blown our minds, and I'm sorry I didn't say a word most of, most of the interview. Uh, when I'm when I'm on with you, sometimes if I if I jump in, our, our my audience will say, "Don't interrupt her." <laughs> so I don't. I know better. I know better than to jump in. Uh, I want to hear every every nugget of thought that goes through your mind. So thank you, as always, Whitney. Um, I'll link up this in the description. People can read this latest piece um, at uh, it's at Bitcoin Magazine, right? Mm-hmm at Bitcoin Magazine. So um, people can check out uh, your latest piece on the satellites. And then, of course, the coming smart wall. We'll have more discussions about that, uh, I'm sure. And I know I've been going back years on this clear. Remember, like clear, you sign up at the airport with a mm -hmm. you scan your mm -hmm. eyeball. And it was I remember even like 15 years ago. That's the promise. You can zip right through security and no problems. You'll be you'll be flying right on the plane and you'll be the first one there. You don't have to worry about it anymore because we've got your eyeball just in your face. It's terrifying. Yeah, they're trying to get people to voluntarily comply with this digital ID agenda. And the way to stop it is to not comply and to not use the system. Uh, it's just going to be, it, I mean, the vaccine passports were a beta test for this. The same uh, exclusionary nature of the vaccine passport is exactly how digital IDs will function. And the way to defeat vaccine passports was not to use them, not to enter into that system, not to comply. And it's the exact same for digital ID. If anything, vaccine pass passports were their efforts to trial out a, a digital ID so style system. And the people that produce digital ID uh, were very, um, were really the people helping engineer vaccine passports during the COVID era. It's all about restricting people's freedom of movement. And if you give willingly give them your biometrics, your 
helping usher in this type of system. And the idea is to make people feel worried about crime, worried about uh, their safety as a way to get people to onboard into these systems. But to, parify, uh, to paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, uh, the more you give up for security, the less liberty you will have. So, uh, you know, I mean, they want us to, out of fear, give up our freedoms. And this is happening across the board, not just with digital ID um, and the smart wall stuff, but really uh, on a lot of other different fronts. And, and the way to get out, you know, around that is to not give into that fear, know what they're pushing for. And uh, unfortunately, I think that we're going to see uh, just uh, unprecedented efforts to get people uh, in independent media, mainstream media, left and right, whoever they can pay off to promote the stuff to people. But it's ultimately a bipartisan agenda. This is the su sustainable development agenda. There's nothing sustainable about it except that, it, you know, it, it's sustainable for the power elite. It's been written by bankers uh, who want to essentially enslave the entire planet even more with debt and surveil everything you do. Um, because surveillance as far, as far it relates to banking and markets, it helps, you know, uh, the predictability of markets. They like that. And that's why you have people like BlackRock's Larry Fink openly say, uh, the markets like totalitarian governments. That's the kind of government that people like Larry Fink like are right. dictatorships. Right. And there's an effort to impose that. Uh, on the world uh, under different dialectics. You know, some they're going to try and sell it in places, I don't know, that, that are more amenable to it, like left under left-leaning rhetoric, like sort of being done in different EU countries. In the U.S., they're probably going to sell it as freedom and all of this other stuff. And that's why you have Anderil, Palantir, these companies saying, we love freedom, America first, and things like that. But they're building the same total totalitarian surveillance dystopian nightmare and putting an American flag on it. And I really hope that Americans can see through the ruse and reject it hmm, hallelujah. and not comply. Yeah, you're right about that. Benjamin Franklin was wise beyond his years and absolutely correct about that. And they do, oh, they always couch it with fear. They always try to get you roped in uh, with a culture of fear to give up your liberty. They did it with 9-11. They did it mm -hmm. with COVID. It's controlling people through fear. And the way to break out of that is to not buy the fear that they're selling. And the more they manipulate online media through censorship, um, buying up different platforms, trying to centralize control, get you to tie your government ID to internet access, the more they'll try and gin up that fear based, you know, uh, media content to try and get you um, agitated and fearful and compliant. Uh, and that's ultimately where this leads. And so we have to be wise to the greater policy agendas here. It's bigger than one party. It's bigger than both parties. This is a truly global agenda uh, with a global surveillance component. Um, and it's uh, coming for our finances. It's coming for our society. It's a multi-pronged attack. And the way to uh, oppose it is to not comply and not give in to the fear. Yeah. 100%. Whitney Webb, always great to see you. Thank you so much for your amazing insights as always, your amazing research, and uh, we will see you real soon. Thank you, Whitney. Mm -hmm.